So it's a real pleasure to be here today. I was in Carretero, and, and I know I'm mangling the name, but um, a number of years ago, and it's a real pleasure to come back and to see you all here. Um, I thought a lot about what to put into my keynote talk today, and I decided to put in three stories. So we have a main story and then two small ones, and I hope that I'll get through them, but if I take too long with the first one, maybe we won't get to the second or the third. But the main theme that I'm gonna be talking about today is something that has started to fascinate me you know, several years ago. And that's how do you turn off what you've turned on in a cell or in a tissue? And the system that really caught my attention was early development, one cell organizing itself into multiple cells. And the question of how does one cell turn into many and that many has a top and a bottom and a front and a back? For me, that was the question I decided to embark on. So my talk today is Heads or Tails, Systems Biology of Wnt Signaling. And that's the system within that cellular organization that I found really quite interesting as the more I looked at it. Um, so just to get us onto the same page, our genome's DNA oversees traits, diseases, susceptibilities, and the big question is how? And as we're doing more and more genome-wide association studies as a community and diving into the genetics underneath it, we're realizing more and more as a community that it's the regulatory effects as much as defects in specific genes making proteins that are underlying diseases, especially diseases of aging and chronic diseases that progress over time. So here's how we're gonna think about this. The genome has encoded in it rules. And an example of a rule is a negative feedback loop. And for example, we have a rule that B turns off A. So if we have a gene A that makes protein B and B turns A off, then we're going to wind up making B, and then B is going to turn that gene off, and then our B level is going to go down. Whoops. Okay, well, I don't want to play that again, but the B level is going to go down. So we, we make exactly what it is that's going to turn things off, negative feedback loop. So let's take a look first at negative regulation in a developmental signaling pathway, WINT, and I'm, I put on here two icons. One is an icon of Wnt itself. Well, I won't bother to point, I'll just. Wnt is gonna be denoted by this yellow circle. It looks a little bit like a Pac-Man. And it's a protein that binds to frizzled receptor. And the little mouse that you see is the binding, is representing the binding site. And the triangle is representing a gradient. So we're gonna look at Wnt, and we're gonna look at gradients of Wnt. So, Eric Davidson decided to put together this network of all of these regulatory interactions that govern the first 24 hours of life of a sea urchin. In the first 24 hours of life of a sea urchin, a sea urchin larvae, and that larvae um, metamorphosing and turning into a mature sea urchin, is the same network, the same fabric that governs those, the equivalent of first 24 hours of life in a sea urchin, in a mouse, or in a human. Well, that really fascinated me. And if I started to drill down on this network and said, well, where are all these negative feedback loops? You know, I was looking at it by hand. And what I realized was that over and over again, the, the wind pathways encoded in this network involved these negative feedbacks. So I said, well, okay, you know, what's going on with wind? And what I learned, and this is work by others, this is classic WINT work, what I learned was the WINT signaling level is higher in what will be the tail of a frog in this case. So this developing tadpole has WINT high in the tail, WINT low in the head. And not just that, but if we look at the planaria over here, wild type, we have a head and a tail. If we knock WINT down, we wind up getting two heads on this planaria. And if we elevate Wnt, if we overexpress it, we wind up getting two tails. And we see a little frog over here that has two heads, indicating 
that it had a little bit too little wind in its head area when it was developing. And we're gonna come back to that two-headed frog. Another icon to look at down here is on the lower in the middle. There's that wind Pac-Man. And this is showing you that what wind does in order to induce a signal at the surface of the cell, it's excreted by, it's produced by another cell, and then it comes and binds to a frizzled receptor. And there are about 19 winds and there are about 10 frizzles, at least in human. And when that happens, this LRP is recruited and that complex together is what leads to the signaling inside. So wind signaling specifies tails and defective wind signaling leads to severe developmental effects. One more. So here we've got this normal gradient, um, tail and head. And if we completely wipe out wind, all we get is tadpoles that have heads. So this is really a very extreme effect. So how does this wind signaling pathway work? Here's a cartoon. A key player in all of this is beta-catenin. Beta-catenin is intracellular, outside the nucleus, inside the cell. So the blue is representing the outside of the cell, and the green is representing the, the nucleus. Now, there's a destruction complex, a whole bunch of proteins that's at work all the time inside the cell, monitoring beta-catenin and saying, hey, not too much. And it destructs that beta-catenin and keeps it from doing anything other than not being there. Now, we have frizzled at the, at the surface. Wind comes along, recruits the LRP and the destru destruction complex. And now the beta-catenin is able to build up and enough of it happens and it crosses into the nucleus and the beta-catenin binds DNA and is a transcription factor, turning on genes. So that's the fundamental way that wind signaling is happening. Now, what else is going on? What's turning on the wind? Well, initiation involves growth factors, cell matrix interactions, cell-cell interactions, and that's been really well studied. Now, progression. Once the signaling pathway has happened, we have transcription factors that cross over into the nucleus, and we have cytoplasmic changes that involve cell morphology, motility. The missing piece in all of this, when I started looking at this, was termination. What stops this wind signaling pathway and allows the next thing to happen? Because <clears throat> clearly, this wind is a transient signal. It's, it needs to be there and high and tail during the development, but we don't want it to be there high over a long period of time. So that became the quest, <coughs> excuse me, to look for the negative feedback regulators in wind. So here's what we knew going into this. We knew that wind um, is inhibited by certain antagonists that are turned on. So wind itself is inhibited. The beta-catenin is inhibited, and that signaling in the destruction complex is also inhibited. Um, so these wind antagonists are operating at a pathway level to inhibit the pathway itself. But what about those target genes, the genes that are turned on by the wind pathway? What happens next after they've been turning on? So we decided to do an experiment well, it was a long experiment, to um, find this terminator of wind signaling. So the first thing is we needed something highly induced in response to wind. So for that, we decided to take advantage of my collaborator, Carl Willard, his ability to isolate biologically active winds. So we took wind 3A and dosed human pluripotent stem cells with the wind 3A over time. Now, what happens when you do that? The cells start to differentiate and they start to organize. So we took cells at each of these time points, 12, 24, and 48 hours, and compared that to zero and did RNA sequencing. And here's what we found. Um, here are the primary genes that came up early. Well, what we're seeing, let's see if it actually works. Well, I don't want to point to it there because the people at home won't see it but I may, or, there we are. So, and I can't tell if that comes up. So I'm, I'll simply say what I'm looking at. So at the top, 
we have dark blue. Dark blue is 100% on. So what we're seeing in the top block are genes that are way on, they're turning off in response to the, to the wind signaling. So the wind signaling is turning off what's happening in the cell right now in order to get ready to do the next thing. And those down-regulated genes are actually pluripotency and neural differentiation genes. The next swath of genes are a lot of genes that are up slightly, and then they go up a little more, a little more. So these are transiently upregulated. They're up and then they turn off or go down. And you'll see one of the genes, it's my favorite name for a gene, it's the T. And T is brachyury. That gene is a known response gene to wind signaling. It goes up and then it turns off, and it's really quite bold. And what we did to take a look at these genes and find them and inspect them was actually to take all these known wind, um, wind response genes and ask what are all the other genes that have the same pattern and make sure that, you know, and, and that's how we discovered clusters of genes that came together. In our next group, we have genes that go up and stay up. And in the last group toward the bottom, we have genes that, that come on late. So those upregulated genes in the, at 24 hours, 48 hours, um, it turns out are primitive endoderm genes. And the genes that come up late are definitive endoderm and also tail bud genes. So it was very interesting to be able to drill down on this time series data and realize that all the known WIMP factors were coming on at the right time and to see these other genes that created this, this patterning and, and the endoderm, for example. Now, we wanted to find a transcription factor. And you'll notice that SP5 is up at about you know, 12 to 24 hours. It's, it's coming up and then it's turning on. So what we found was a transcription factor, SP5, highly induced in response to Wnt. And then the only known transcription factor at that time that was highly induced was axon 2. And here I'm comparing the SP5 levels, and this is through qPCR, at, at different times from 0 hours to 24 hours. And you can see that axon 2 is induced, strongly induced, at 6 hours and goes down. And SP5, in turn, goes up and continues to go up. And as we saw in the previous slide, it continues to go up and it goes up even, even higher. And we confirm that at the protein level as well. So we had our culprit, SP5, um, highly induced transcription factor, well, highly induced in response to wind. And now we wanted to see what does it do as a transcription factor? Well, SP5 is part of the SP family of proteins. SP1 is the major member of the family. SP1 occupies many, many genes across the genome in any given tissue. When you have a gene that's on, SP1 goes and it binds a, a GC-rich site, and we'll come to that in a moment, and, and to keeps that gene on. SP5 has a repressor domain in that it doesn't bind the cofactors that keep the gene on. Instead, it goes and knocks SP1 off and binds instead and thereby sets it up for that gene to, for that transcription factor turn, to turn off. And these, um, the images down here are showing the co-localization in the nucleus um, of the SP5. So what does SP5 target? Let's figure that out. Well, we use ChIP-seq for that. And here I'm showing SP5 cross-linked with DNA and then ChIP-seq, we use our antibodies, we do the antibody pull down. So it turned out this was actually a really hard thing to do because SP5 is expressed at very low levels. So the normalization I was showing you was percent of maximum expression level. SP5 is a whiff of protein compared to SP1. And we needed to do ChIP-seq on SP1. We wanted to see where are the peaks where SP1 goes down and do those same peak areas, not bind SP5, and then have SP5 going up. This was tough, and we literally had to use a bottle to, to grow our cells and to gain enough material to do this chip seek. But we did it. And kind of cutting to the chase, this Venn diagram is showing you that challenge between SP1 on the bottom. So what you're seeing in the purple circle is SP1 untreated, 
and you're seeing that there's 16,000 plus 20,000 genes. You know, virtually every gene is bound by SP1. And then we treat with Wnt, and we see that fewer genes, 20,000 20, genes are bound by SP1, and another 4,000 have, or you know, sites, I should say, these are peaks, not genes, sites are, um, are popping up. And meanwhile, with the SP5, we were able to look at the SP5 peaks that co-localize with SP1 peaks and distinguish them from SP5 peaks that SP5 is binding there, but there was no SP1. So we drilled down on this <clears throat> and decided to create a query. And we set up all our peak information, made lots and lots of tables, loaded them in, and our query was SP1 peak exists and it's high, SP1 peak becomes lower under Wnt 3A treatment. SP5 peak is in the same place, the same region. We had to define region within our query. And it's low or nil, virtually not there, under untreated. And it binds strongly under the treatment. So we were able to go in and find all the genes, or all the peak sites, I should say. I keep saying genes, but it's really the peak sites. That, that followed this pattern. Then we took out the sequence, so another query, this time to the genome, took out the sequence and ran meme and asked the question, what are, you know, what is the binding site? What is the motif for the SP1 that doesn't bind SP5? And you're seeing that on the right-hand side. And the SP1 peak regions that do get displaced that's our hypothesis, by the SP5. And what you see is that they're virtually the same, these poly G regions, you know, these G boxes, and with a little tiny difference in this one base in the middle. So, so, so we looked at that, and then we asked the question, okay, what are all of the peak regions that meet this pattern and have this particular motif in them. And what we found was a really cool set of target genes. If you're a developmental biologist and you're interested in the Wnt signaling pathway, you look at these and then you say, well, what else is in there that I've never seen before? And one of the reasons I wanted to put this up as well was, you know, AMOT2 is a good example. So on the top, on the left, I can hardly see my own writing here. Okay, on the top, we've got Axon2. Underneath it, we have AMOT1. And the AMOT peaks are, they're lined up right underneath each other. And this goes to the whole chip seek and calling peaks and noisy data and having to write your queries so that they accommodate the fact that biological data is noisy. So on the top, we've got the Axon2. On the bottom, we've got you know, another gene, GSC. And what you're seeing is a broad peak versus a narrow peak. So we had to make sure that our query acted dynamically. And on the upper right, you know, we're seeing SP5 really upregulated. And that SP1, you know, the area under the curve is going down, but that SP1 is binding across the, the, the entire region. So our query had to accommodate the fact that the way these SPs are binding in these binding site regions varies from one gene regulatory region to another, but we found them. So, so that focused us in on 662 genes that are controlled by SP5. But what's SP5 actually doing? You know, what does it do physiologically? So we engineered cell lines with CRISPR-Cas9 and we created two clones where we had an SP5 reporter, but SP5 itself was knocked out. So we were able to show that through the qPCR here at 0, 12, 24, and 48 hours, in our wild type, um, the SP5 is going up, and in our clones, in the reporter, it's going up even more strongly. And we could, and you know, I put the, the chipsy peaks over here so that you could see. Um, so SP5 itself regulates SP5. That was one of our findings. Now, we did more RNA-seq. And what we're seeing here is wild type, our first clone, and our second clone. 
all in a row. So we have three panels and we have the time series for each one. And what you're seeing is that at 48 hours in our SP5 knockouts, these genes that are regulated by SP5, so the genes that are turned off by SP5 and they go up to the dark blue a certain amount, they're going up even higher, like much higher in our SP5 knockout clones. So the point here, and the red is indicating um, more than 100% of the expression level in the wild type cells. So blue, if you reach the dark blue, you're at 100% in the wild type cells, 100% um, of expression level under WIN3A um, treatment. And in our two clones, these exact 662 genes are going up even more and, and kind of going out of control. And again, what we're seeing is our, so and this, these are organized the same way as before with our mesendoderm coming up early and then transiently going, well, going back down, our endoderm, primitive endoderm coming up late and the definitive endoderm genes coming up really, really late. So what do the cells actually do? So the, here we see our wild type cells from top to bottom at day one, day four, day seven, and day 10. So this is over time. And we're seeing that these cells just, they become very disorganized and out of control, um, it, differentiation defects in these cells. And what we're also seeing here are a few key genes, FOXA2, MIXL1, and SOX1. Those gene expression levels are going way up in our two clones compared to wild type over um, in our 10th day. So, so, so what we've done is we've nailed down that um, SP5, so WINT induces many, many genes, and it induces them in time series in a, kind of an exquisite way for controlling different, the early differentiation and organization. We found that SP5 was the most upregulated transcription factor. And even though it was the most differential, it's expressed at low levels, and it's specifically controlling 662 genes. It may be controlling more, but we were able to define that these 662, it definitely was controlling. And SP5 is reining in the response of these genes to Wnt. So for the Wnt signaling community, the people who, who study the Wnt pathway, and there's a whole community of researchers on this, this handed them 662 genes to focus on to try to figure out you know, what exactly is the role of these genes in Wnt signaling. So to put it all together, what we have is initiation. So the Wnt, um, by recruiting the destruction complex, as I showed you, beta catenin builds up, crosses into the nucleus, becomes, it's active as a transcription factor, target genes turn on, including Wnt antagonists. Those Wnt antagonists turn off the Wnt signaling itself by halting the, the beta catenin, halting the progression of the pathway. So progression stops, and then SP5 finishes. It terminates this Wnt signaling event that's going on that's taking a stem cell that's in its pluripotent state, very happily making more stem cells, and makes it turn into the next state ready to differentiate. So now I want to turn to, um, this is a separate piece of work, and this was done by, um, by Brigitte Galano's lab in Boston. She looked at WINT, um, at the WINT3 signaling and the SP5 in Hydra. And in a nutshell, here's what she found. This is a really cool paper. I encourage reading it just for you know, all the science that went into it. But here we have a wild type Hydra. Hydra has a head. And there was, and there's Win3 being expressed at the Win3 rather than Win3A in the Hydra, being expressed at what's going to be the head bud. Not a lot of Win, but a little Win. And now, if we knock out, if she knocks out SP5, what happened is that bud made many, many heads. So just like with that frog, um, where if you knock out the Win, you get only heads in your tadpoles. In the hydra, knocking out the SP5 led to the many heads. So this was a wonderful demonstration in a completely non-human organism that SP5, which is conserved from hydra to human, um, has the effect of 
suppressing wind. If we knock out SP5, it's very much physiologically like knocking out wind. So what have we learned? We've learned that wind signaling controls head versus tail organization. We've looked at RNA-seq, ChIP-seq, and CRISPR-Cas9 experiments, and that nailed down that SP5 is not only a new transcription factor in wind signaling, it's a negative controller, and it terminates wind signaling. And as stem cells with no SP5 grow abnormally, hydra with no SP5 grow multiple heads. So that was just a really neat thing to look at. So what else does WINT do? We've seen, you know, organizing the first 24 hours of life, this is a critical pathway. And from hydra to sea urchin to mouse to human. When WINT goes wrong, we go from organized to disorganized. And in fact, there are many, many, many WINT pathway mutations in cancer. There's been recognized in about 2014 this notion of WINT-addicted tumors. And this next um, series of three slides is really about cells talking to cells and really healthy cells talking to cancer cells. So in this cartoon, I'm going to walk you through WINT-addicted cancer tumors. So we have a regular old cell that's not a cancer cell nearby a cancer cell. We have intracellular space, um, extracellular here. And so we have intracellular and in, this should be inter, intracellular, intercellular, but I've used the word extracellular here. Okay. So a cell is always making low levels of WINT. The porcupine gene is one of my favorite and fruit fly, the fruit flies start to look like porcupine, so it got its name. Porcupine puts a lipid onto the new inactive Wnt protein. So I'm denoting it here by Wnt sub I for inactive. Porcupine comes along, puts the lipid on, that activates the Wnt and enables it via another single gene, single protein, um, wingless, to get out and signal to other nearby cells. So in any tissue, you generally have a low level of Wnt all the time. And that low level of WINT is actually essential for maintaining pluripotency. It's essential for renewal. It's essential for wound repairing. So WINT low all the time is something that just needs to happen. So over here in the cancer cell, frizzled gets expressed. We've got that beta catenin. And here are some of the specific factors that turn off frizzled. So RNF43 and ZNRF3. And I've also put down here SP5, because I'm going to come back to that. So we know from work done by Liu et al. and Kuo et al. that cancer cells that develop mutations in these genes wind up not turning the frizzled off. So more and more frizzles build up. So these cancer cells are the ones that become Wnt addicted. They're Wnt addicted in that they take those low levels of Wnt and amplify the signal to the cancer cell. And the cancer cell can just go crazy with growing um, and proliferating because of taking advantage of this low level of Wnt signaling that's always in the background. So Novartis and separately in Singapore, compounds were screened and found to inhibit porcupines. So porcupines on the X chromosome and if it's in, it inhibited, then what we get is no lipid on that Wnt. Wnt can't be excreted. Now, the person's not in a very healthy condition, so this is not a great drug to, to take, um, just, like any, you know, just like anywhere else. And what we, well, what happens is the cancer cell now isn't getting its Wnt signaling, and it's unable to pro proliferate. So these are potent drugs, but they're wiping out that, that low level of wind in the background. So the next question becomes, well, is there a way to somehow localize um, the dosing so that it goes only to the cells that are near the cancer cells? So for that, um, Carl Willard's lab, my collaborator in all this, has been focusing on the frizzles themselves and antibodies to the frizzles to recruit um, cancer drugs specifically to the cancer cells that are that are these wind addicted cells. So what we oh and I wanted to remark on SP5. So in all of this picture, are there wind addicted cells, cancer cells, 
that have sp5 mutations where the sp5 is what's um what's driving so so that's an open question and i wanted to put this vignette in here to say now that we've discovered these specific factors we can go back and look at these systems that we know exist and ask how do these genes that we found not just sp5 but the 662 work in this system so to summarize this piece of the talk um, we've looked at negative regulation in a particular developmental signal pathway. We've seen that wind organizes head versus tail. We've seen that it works through SP5, which turns itself off and turns 661 other genes off through negative feedback loops. Um, and we've taken a look at these addicted cancer cells and posed the question, well, how does this negative feedback loop work within these addicted cancer cells? So now I want to turn to the next level down in WINT. So we're going to look at um, beyond heads and tails. I want to take you through neuroprogenitor cells and WINT signaling. And in particular, we're going to look at the WINT gradient in lineage restriction. And I'll draw your attention to the, um, to, to the cartoon over here where we have the the forebrain on the left in red, the hindbrain on, in yellow on the right. So again, heads and tails, but this is within the head, and more than within the head, it's within the, within the nervous system. So here again, we know that pluripotent stem cells um, differentiate into endoderm, well, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. And we know that each of these types of differentiated cells form different tissues. So the question becomes, Wnt is organizing left to right, front to back, head to tail. Is What is Wnt doing and how is it doing it within each of these you know, three directions of differentiation? Well, it turns out that there are gradients of Wnt in, you know, let's focus on within ectoderm. And we have the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and skin being made from the ectoderm. And so the question becomes, you know, how, how is this gradient organized and, and what does it do? So let's take a look at neural progenitor cells. So again, here's the, here's the stem cell and, you know, how is it organizing to create neurons that are going to be in the different parts? Is it just that the neuron happens to be there and then it gets signals from the outside and then it becomes forebrain? Or is that neuron becoming forebrain even when it's in a pool of neurons? So let's take a look. So here's the experiment we set up. This was with David Brathman, who's now at Arizona State University. Um, as, a, as a faculty member. So human stem cells, grow them into neural rosettes, and those neural rosettes will become, each cell in it, neural progenitor cells. So we can make these neural progenitor cells. Well, what David did was to set up a SOX2 signaling. Um, so basically, this is a Wnt responsive reporter. So that Wnt comes along, beta catenin, um, induces, and the cells are going to express GFP according to the amount of response to Wnt that they're getting. And then we can cell sort them. So single cell sequencing is great, but it's very, very noisy. And I have found that having reporter cells, and then you do this, and then you sort the cells, and then you do single cell sequencing, or reporter cells, and you simply do bulk on the cells that are at a certain reporter level. So here, we, we sorted into the cells, these neuroprogenitor cells that are low, went, and these are still neuroprogenitor cells. And they're different. They're responding differently to the same went signal that these cells are bathed in. Some of them are responding in a very low way, some of them in the middle, and some of them high. And so we cell sorted and we, um, we took each one. And well, so, so in, this exam, in this cartoon, what I'm showing you is that the low went became, or you know, organized to become forebrain. 
the middle become the midbrain, and the high winds are becoming the, the hindbrain and spinal cord. So again, low to high, front to back, head to tail, and in here, forebrain to spinal cord um, in this wind response. So we did RNA-seq in each of these, and we compared here the very low wind to the high wind, and we found that um, there were 566 genes that were significantly upregulated when the GFP was high, indicating that there was a strong response to the WINT signaling and the, in these neuroprogenitor cells and 707 genes that were low. And once again, we organized them into, um, well, we, we organized them by their expression levels. What you're seeing on the left are all of the genes that are specific to, um, to the WINT system. And you'll see at the very top, um, I don't know how well you can read it, but the very top, top, top one is SP5. So SP5 is way, way up. So on the axis down below, you have GFP high on the right, GFP low on the left, and we have the differential expression in the high versus low shown as bars, as the degree of expression. So we're seeing that what we expect to see, that GFP high, SP5 is high. And all of the, those genes that came on in our experiment where we simply treated stem cells with WINT, here, the neural, neuroprogenitor cells are responding the same way. We're seeing the same genes over and over. That's a good thing. And on the right, what we're seeing is that the um, forebrain, um, genes that are, that are typical of the of forebrain organization are in gray at the top, and those are lower in the GFP low. And toward the bottom, we have the hindbrain, genes that are typical and characteristic of the hindbrain. So again, we're seeing WINT, we're seeing our friends, the genes that are, we know are responsive to WINT in this experiment, and we're seeing this organization of the neuroprogenitor cells, even when they're just cells in a dish. They haven't done any organization yet, but they're ready to become forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain type neurons. So what we saw with this experiment is that this WINT gradient is instructing this anterior, posterior positional identity of neural progenitor cells in a dish. So we thought that was pretty cool. So what we're, so the bottom line on this is that with a WINT gradient, lineages, and it's not just ectoderm, it's the endoderm tissues, it's the mesoderm tissues, same thing. So we've looked at this in kidney now, now as well or kidney progenitor cells. So lineages are restricted early during, H, during the human pluripotent stem cell differentiation. WINT is that patterning factor. And endogenous WINT signals are influencing differentiation of these stem cells, well, of the neuroprogenitor cells in this, in this experiment. So we've gone beyond heads and tails. And we've looked at the neuroprogenitor cells. We've seen the WINT gradient in lineage restriction. And, and we've kind of nailed that not only is WINT signaling organizing at the gross body level, but it's, it's organizing intracellularly at a cell level what a cell is going to be ready to become. And we've seen in this talk that it's all being done through the SP5. So that's actually it, and I think I'm finishing a little bit early, but um, I want to acknowledge all my collaborators. Ian Huggins did the SP5 work. Um, well, Nathan Kumar did the, the kidney work that I didn't show you, and um, Sanjay Nigam was a collaborator on the kidney work, and then Carl Willert for the WINT work, and my bioinformatics team, um, my student Tessa, who's now graduated, and Seymour, who's in graduate school. So thank you very much for listening and I'm willing to take questions. Thank you. I think it's not working. Just a second, please. Oh, no, it was off. Okay, okay good. Oh, now it's good. Okay, thank you so much for the talk. 
I, I found it super interesting, like particularly I'm interested to know, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, when did SP5 emerge, particularly given that the, I mean, there's some evidence that some of the factors that are important for uh, metazoan characteristics, metazoan development characteristics actually emerge before the actual characteristics you're looking for. And there is kind of rearrangements in the gene regulatory networks that then um, give rise to these uh, phenotypes. So for example, the presentation of specific axes. So I'm just curious to know when, uh, when that happened, if you know, like when did SP5 emerge? Yeah, so I, you know, I love being able to go back to previous slides. I'm just gonna put up, uh, sorry, yep, here it is. Um, I'll go even earlier. There we are. So SP5 is virtually off in the pluripotent cells. So the stem cells that are doing nothing at all, they have that low level of wind signaling because all cells always have that low level. And SP5 is not coming on so much in the very first 12 hours, but it's, it's really coming on boldly in the 24 hours and in the 48 hours. So these other genes that come up, actually that's a slide that would be fun to put together. The 662 genes that are SP5 controlled, like just take the heat map and do those. So I'm gonna put that together and that's really gonna be in part the answer to your question. You know, is it a late reaction? to the SP5, you know, because do these other genes come up with SP5? Do they come up early? You know, does, you know, what is it that SP5 is turning off? And here, when we did the qPCR, what we were seeing at a more fine grain level, so this is the three hour, six hour, 12 hour, and 24 hour, you know, it is coming up. Yeah, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's creeping up. You know, at, at these earlier time points. So we didn't do the earlier time points in the RNA-seq, but we did them in the qPCR. Yeah, and actually I was more interested in when they did emerge evolutionarily speaking. Oh, oh <laughs> <Sorry>. okay. <laughs> Just because I was I, I, time series. So, oh, good question. Yeah, Hydra, so multicellular organisms. So Hydra isn't even a vertebrate. So, yeah. and the SP5 is highly conserved. Um, okay. Yeah, it, it's there in, in the Hydra. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. We, we did some work on the sponges, uh, oh. so coriferans, and then uh, like uh, we have some evidence that suggests that the first metazoan cell was a pluripotent stem cell. So I would be curious. And I did, well, I did so some analysis on SP5. promoters. It, it, yeah, there's an SP5. That, that would be really interesting to look at. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah, there's a huge enrichment for SP binding sites in uh, at least in the sponge we looked at, like huge, like it's the most abundant um, site in the whole genome. Wow. But I don't know how it links to this. I just was curious. Yeah, and you know, know. there's Thank a you. whole family of the SPs. SP5 was the one induced in response to WINT3A. So this is the thing about the WINTs. There are 19 WINTs in human. Um, every organism has, a, a, I'll call it a cloud of WINTs. And if you do an evolutionary tree, of, well, if you do human and mouse, they'll line up with each other. But what you really see, it's just like the Annexin family. When you do the tree, there's a radiation that happens of the genes within the organism. So every organism is somehow, it, it has its own set of wints. And, and the wint to frizzled is a one-to-one -one reaction or interaction as well. So a wonderful question is, is the family of SP5 is the same way. Now here we're looking very narrowly at Win3A, SP5, Frizzled7, and I didn't give the Frizzled in the talk, but Frizzled7 in human stem cells, H1 cells. So, <laughs> so great question, yeah. Thank you. Do we have any questions in the online group? Nope. Okay. Javier, I think. Hi, Terry. Nice talk. Thank you. Um, your model on the cancer cell, no? the cancer cell is like feeding or eating the wind, the wind 
uh, or activating the wind signal in the other cell. Okay, the other cell is in a stem cell because we did we did a study with uh, in myeloma uh, cancer cells, human myeloma cancer cells, and with mesenchymal stem cells, and we uh, study what is the relations of the link of the um, uh, mesenchymal stem cell on the on the uh, patients in cancer, and we observe that the cancer cell activated the wind signaling mm. into the uh, stem cell, probably in the way that you say they are addicting to the wind signaling, but this our our uh, understanding of the results that we observed in this study is that the myeloma cells activated the wind signaling into the mesenchymal and uh, probably this was one of the, our results. In your case, is something similar or because what is the model there? This is in yeah. your case, this is a in vitro model or uh, for this? Right, yeah, so here this is, um, so, so, so this is an in, the, in the dish, and so in, in, in vitro model. However, um, what you found is really interesting because you know, it's the stem cells that need that low level of wind to maintain the pluripotency of the stem cell. And that's kind of the, the contradiction. You need wind at low levels in order to remain a stem cell and wind at higher levels you know, induces the, pro the proliferation and differentiation. So, yeah. I, yes, I mean, uh, for us, was interesting also, I, I have to say to you that, the, you know, in humans, there are several wind pathways. One is, and the one that was activated was the non-canonical wind in the stem cell. Mm -hmm. So it's, for us, I mean, in your talk, this is very interesting. I, I will yeah. have So a I have RNA-seq data with wind 5 a which is thought to be a non-canonical wind um, pathway activator. So it might be interesting to take a look at that okay. response. And we haven't been able to do much of, at all with the, R, with the wind 5 a The signal is very low. We don't know what to look for. It's, you know, it, it, we know it's doing something, but it's very difficult to figure it out. So that might be, you know, it might be wind 5 a the non-canonical okay. wind okay. That's, that's responding there. But what your question brings up as well is this idea that the cancer cell so not only, you know, in this case, I was showing the wind addiction, you know, the cancer cell mutations knock out that which is reducing, you know, basically dampening the frizzles so that more and more frizzled proteins get made on the surface so that no matter what the exogenous wind signal is, even a whiff of that wind on the outside, they can take advantage of. This idea, of inducing the cells next door, your, stem, your mesenchymal stem cells, to make more wind is a very interesting um, okay. finding. Because there, you know, what, what, what that means is, is the cancer cells would be, so what would make more wind? Well, making more wind would again, so that could be the knockouts in the SP5, because the SP5 is controlling um, directly the, the, the wind, several of the wind genes. So there could okay. be something going on. I will on. look at, I will. <laughs> Thinking I will, out loud here, folks. <laughs> I will like look at to our results because I, we didn't, I mean, I don't know what was the behavior in our uh, study of SP5. But yeah. I will yeah. have a look at that. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to study something that's broken, which is effectively a cancer cell, in order to find out how, how, to, how does basic biology when it's appropriate work. So, um, we have one question from Gustavo Rodriguez that he's attending online. He said, if I'm not mistaken, wind proteins are glycosylated. If so, how does glycosylation impact wind signaling, especially if in the cancer cell scenario where glucose metabolism is altered? <laughs> 
all right, we're getting out of my scope of, of background. You know, if you'd asked me about compilers and operating systems, I could have said something. <laughs> However, um, yes, glycosylation on the wind protein is a very important factor. And there's a whole entire active community looking at how does glycosylation, you know, in, how is glycosylation involved in wind signaling? So it's a great, his question poses a hypothesis, and that's that the cancer cells are altering the glycolytic processes, and that that may also somehow make it easier or even harder for the wing to bind. Yeah. 